presentation this evening. So we're going to just take a second or two to get folks in place because you're not going to want to miss anything. Um, so we're glad that you are here. Get comfortable and we'll get started in just probably about a half a minute. And if you are just joining us, welcome. And for folks who are just coming in, welcome to our Isaac's parents and faculty, staff, administrators. We're excited to have such a robust group this evening. And we're just taking just a half a minute to get folks admitted to the session. And I think uh, as folks are coming in, we're going to go ahead and get some of the logistics out of the way so we have plenty of time for the presentation. And now a formal welcome to the third webinar in our 22-23 parent series. And tonight we are featuring Religious Diversity, A Great American Strength with Ibu Patel from Interfaith America. I'm Jill Webb, Isaac's Director of Learning, and we're just delighted that you are with us this evening. I'd also like to introduce my colleagues, Mary Manacho, Isaac's Executive Director, Karen Zeitlin, Director of Programs, and Jacob Isaac, Director of Technology and Client Services. And these are the folks who make everything possible. This session is being hosted in the Zoom webinar format, so you will only be able to see and connect with the panelists and our presenter and Isaac staff. Everyone has entered with your microphone muted and you will remain so during the presentation. Most likely at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat feature and a Q&A feature. And we're going to ask you to use the Q&A feature to post any questions that you have for Eboo. Um, if you've got any technical issues, you can use the chat so that the Isaac staff can see that, but we'll also see it in the Q&A. Um, we encourage you to post questions and comments, and we'll work to bring as many questions as we can during um, this hour that we have together. And as I said, we are delighted that you have joined us for this Isaac's Learning Community. As learners, we ask everyone to enter each session as listeners, learners, and thoughtful contributors. We welcome a variety of perspectives with a focus on understanding as opposed to debating. And our hope is for each session to serve as a springboard for additional conversations, either in your family or at home or at school. We thank you in advance for your willingness to respectfully listen and learn right along with us. And at Isaacs, it is our goal to create support and protect a trusting community of learners where it is safe for all of us to share with each other. And to that end, Isaacs prohibits the recording of any portion of the webinar, as well as the unapproved posting of presenter or participant comments or resources from any of the Isaac sessions. We are recording tonight's presentation and within 24 to 48 hours, you'll receive an email from Isaacs with instructions on how to access the recording. And for this, webinar, the recording will be available to access to registered schools all the way until May 31st. Recordings and resources for all the parent series are posted on a private dedicated web page that's available to registered schools, and the link will be shared in the post-webinar email, and we recommend that you bookmark it uh, for future reference. And now a bit about our presenter. Ibu Patel is a widely acclaimed civic leader who believes that religious diversity is an essential and inspiring dimension of American democracy. 
named one of America's best leaders by U.S. News and World Report. He is founder and president of Interfaith America, which was formerly known as Interfaith Youth Council, the leading interfaith organization in the United States. And under his leadership, Interfaith America has worked with governments, universities, private companies, and civic organizations to make faith a bridge of cooperation rather than a barrier of division. He served on President Obama's inaugural Faith Council, has given hundreds of keynote addresses, and wrote five books, including We Need to Build, Field Notes for Diverse Democracy, published in May of 2020. He is an Ashoka Fellow and holds a doctorate in sociology of religion from Oxford University, where he studied on a Rhodes Scholarship. And before we hear directly from Ibu, um, we have a video that introduces the organization that Ibu leads, Interfaith America, and its vision for the nation. We'll share a little bit more information about this um, in the post-webinar communication that you get from Isaacs, but Ibu has given permission to use the video and he, we will share the link to this that you can use at your school. So that's a, a gift to all of us. So Jacob, I think we're ready for the video. We have before us a momentous opportunity to create the world's first truly interfaith nation. We need to build American Medina, a city on a hill made holy by the wideness of its welcome, the strength of its bonds. Look at its shining. The Catholic university where Muslim immigrants learn, the Jewish hospital where Hindu babies are born. The eyes of the world are upon you. We need to build a Sangha whose chants of loving kindness change the climate, bridge divides and bind hearts. We need to build the beloved community where we see each other, the Baptists and Mormons who farm fields and fight fires together, the witnesses who watch over the whole block. We need to build the new Jerusalem, tents for angels to dwell, tabernacles for the tribes, 12, 12,000, 12 million. They will not cease to be diverse. They come from across the earth, seeking the sacredness of knowing one another. Every refugee a pilgrim, every stranger a friend, until we are a nation. This interfaith America, pluralist Rashtra, diverse democracy, achieving our country, where our hopes are prophecies, where we offer longar to our friends and our enemies, where we do not wait for sickness to pray for one another's health, where we defeat the things we do not love by building the things we do. We need to build. And after that beautiful video, I hope you will join me in welcoming Ibu Patel. Hi there, friends. I will imagine I will imagine your warm introductory applause. So, <laughs> thank you for thank you, Jill, for for uh, inviting that. Um, it's great to be with you today. I've been working with Isaacs for many years. Um, I always appreciate working with the organization, and I've visited many of your. Uh, in individual schools also. And, and, and those are always uh, enriching visits for me and I hope for the students, staff, teachers, and administrators of the, of the school as well. So thank you again for having me. Um, if we could put up uh, um, my first slide here. Thank you, Jacob. Forward one more. So, uh, we're, we live in a powerful American moment where, where diversity is talked about uh, an awful lot. Uh, and it's typically around race, gender, and sexuality. And these are hugely important dimensions of diversity. Uh, but I frankly think that religious identity and diversity doesn't get talked about as much as it ought to. And that's of course what this presentation is about. And I think that there are at least four reasons why 
including religious identity and diversity in the curriculum of independent schools is really important. And these are in no particular order. Uh, uh, so I'll just take the first one, but you know, some, it could, it could easily be in reverse order here. So I'll go, just go to the first one. Uh, it's, it's part of the definition of being an educated person. And one of the ways to think about this is, is one interesting definition of an edu educated person is, is can you read the Sunday New York Times and know what's going on in the articles? You know, have, have, have uh, enough of a background in, in general education uh, from science to the arts, to business, to international politics, to the economy, to, to know what's going on in the articles. Uh, and, and there's plenty of religion news in the world, plenty of religion news in the world. And to have a sense when you're reading an article on a controversy about the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad in an art history class at Hamlin University, which was a front page article in the New York Times uh, Sunday before last, to have a sense of, of um, the sensitivities around that, uh, the diversity of the Muslim world, the length of the history of the Muslim tradition, the notion that there might be internal disagreements about that, the reason that this became a national issue. Uh, it's part of the definition of being an educated person. And, and if you've never encountered kind of an, the intellectual exploration of religion in an educational environment, you just won't have that knowledge. You just won't have that knowledge. And in my mind, that, that just means you, you're not able to navigate the, the world in, in the manner that independent school graduates should be able to navigate it as an educated person. The second reason to include religious identity and diversity in the curriculum is to be an excellent professional. So listen, whether you are a doctor or a diplomat, uh, you're gonna deal with religious identity and diversity. Um, so if you think about a hospital setting, I mean, part of what happens in hospitals is people die and different religions actually have different definitions for what counts as the moment of death. Uh, in many Western traditions, it is, uh, it is when uh, somebody stops, uh, uh, when somebody goes brain dead, but in other traditions, it's, it's about the breath. And so if you're dealing with a Buddhist, or if you're dealing with an Orthodox Jew, it may well be the case that that person as a deaf family has a different definition of the moment of death than say hospital policy does. And the first time you encounter that as a doctor should not be at the patient's bedside. In other words, you should learn about those kinds of interesting complexities and challenges in school. You are not an excellent doctor if you don't have a sense of the religious sensitivities and complexities and issues that people from different religions would bring to the table. And it's the same thing as a diplomat. If you are assigned uh, to be a diplomat in Turkey or in India or in Nepal or in Iraq or in Israel uh, or, in, uh, um, or in Lebanon, you're going to be dealing with a whole range of religious identity complexities. And in order to be an excellent diplomat, you will have to have encountered those issues and questions in school. The third reason is to be an effective citizen. So, you know, if you were looking for uh, a Martin Luther King Jr. event or service project yesterday, there's a reasonable chance it involved faith communities because not only was King, of course, a great faith hero, he was after all the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., not just Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but so many volunteer programs and civic programs and educational programs are actually organized by faith communities. Uh, one of the interesting things that I, I did in the past couple of years was I paid a visit to the Greater Chicagoland Food Depository. And I asked them uh, the, about the involvement of faith communities in, in that institution. And what they told me is that something like two thirds of their volunteers come from diverse faith communities and two thirds of their distribution sites are diverse religious communities. And the CEO said to me, we just couldn't do our work without that partnership, right? And so if you're going to be involved in an active way in civil society, in volunteering, in service, in et cetera, et cetera, you're gonna be dealing with different religious communities or different non religious nonprofits in one way, shape or form. You just can't be an effective citizen unless you have some idea how to deal with people from different religions in those kinds of ways. And finally, and, and just as important as anything else, 
uh, spiritual and religious development is, is a part of everybody's life. And, and for some people, it is a very clear and particular faith commitment. They're Catholic or they're Jewish or they're Muslim, and they're learning more about that tradition, including how that tradition relates positively to people from other traditions. And for some people, it's a journey. But uh, um, one of the reasons people come to independent schools is because there's a comfort level in an independent school in the exploration of spiritual and religious identity and the development of that. And I think in, in, in engaging that directly, particularly if you have a faith heritage, of course, but even if you don't, even if you don't, it would seem to me to be a really important part of an in, independent school education. So those are the uh, four of the many reasons why including religious identity and diversity in the curriculum is an important thing for independent schools. Uh, my next slide is a video of uh, a friend and a colleague of mine, the Reverend uh, Jennifer Bailey, but somebody that I've known since I started this organization. She, she actually uh, joined uh, one of our first programs when she was a 16-year-old student at Whitney Young, and she really exemplifies uh, um, learning about uh, interfaith issues uh, as a part of, of my organization 20 years ago when, 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 she, when she joined as a student. And I think her story kind of encapsulates many of these things here. And so I'll ask Jacob to flip the slide and, and show you this, this short two minute video of the story of Reverend Jen Bailey. My first week of high school was 9-11. I remember turning on the news and seeing leaders demonize religious minorities. It hit close to home. Growing up in America with black skin, I knew what it was like to be otherized. Walking with friends who were Muslim, Sikh, Palestinian, Pakistani, and seeing their experience radicalized me as a Christian. I was raised in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, of which I'm now proud and honored to be clergy. In 1787, the white parishioners and leadership of St. George Methodist Episcopal Church would not allow black parishioners to pray. One Sunday, Richard Allen and others kneeled at the altar and were pulled from their knees. They walked out and started what would become the Black Church Movement. The Black Church, as we know it, began as a protest movement against racial injustice. In 2015, I spoke from the pulpit of another AME church, Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama, on the 50th anniversary of the voting rights marches, where the young people of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, were on the ground organizing. So many of them were deeply rooted in their Christian faith and inspired by teachings from a wide range of the world's religions. I stood where the photo was taken of the great religious leaders of different faiths coming together to push for racial justice. And I realized that Selma was an interfaith movement. It's one point in a larger story of interfaith cooperation for racial justice that goes back to Gandhi's Satyagraha movement in India and forward to the struggle against apartheid and All right, we might be having some issues with that video. I'm just gonna keep plowing through here. We'll include that video uh, uh, in the uh, uh, post email um, uh, so that you can use this in, in classes as well. Um, but you can see how learning about a range of interfaith issues shapes Jen's identity. And a big part of that is learning about the history of her own church, her own uh, uh, identity, and also how it connects with the history of other identities, India, South Africa, the civil rights movement, et cetera, et cetera. So, so for me, it's a powerful example of, of, of how learning about interfaith issues can shape uh, the life of a young leader. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? So uh, my organization, Interfaith America, uh, a couple of years ago did what, what, what is the largest survey of religious identity and diversity in higher education that's ever been done. We, we surveyed 120 colleges, uh, 20,000 plus students, uh, and we did it three times. It was a longitudinal survey. And part of what we asked uh, on college campuses was, was how much time do you spend paying attention to particular religion, particular diversity issues? And you can see that, that on college campuses, uh, two thirds or more of students say that they dedicate uh, uh, quite a bit of time to learning about people of different races, people from different nations, people from different political backgrounds, 
people of different sexualities. It's 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 something that uh, um, people from from it, it's something that that colleges spend spend a good bit of time on. Now, now I wish all of these numbers were ninety nine percent or hundred percent, right? But two thirds plus is is not bad for for a set of diversity issues. So interesting question. What percentage of students say that they s- dedicate time to learning about religious diversity issues, right? You'll notice that there's nothing about religious diversity that's north of 61%. So Jacob, if you could click on the next, uh, uh, go to the, go show us the orange bars. So it's kind of a striking disparity, right? It's kind of a striking disparity. Um, Fewer than 50% of college students say that they spend any time uh, learning about people from different religions. Um, Muslims are the highest, 46%. And frankly, uh, uh, my my, uh, wild guess is that that's not so much about deep appreciation of Islam, and it's it's more about uh, um, the it's more about uh, the the political issues uh, um, that Muslims have been involved in in the past several years. Uh, um, And, you know, you've Latter-day Saints and Hindus below 30%. In any case, the larger story is our institutions of higher education are spending quite a bit of time teaching on issues of politics, uh, racial identity, uh, gender and sexual identity. And let me affirm, I think these things are really important. But when it comes to religious identity and diversity, there's n- fewer than 50% of students say they spend any time on that at all. And part of what that means is I think, frankly, independent schools have an even greater responsibility because unless you're sending your students to Notre Dame or Georgetown, right, uh, or only Notre Dame and Georgetown, they're not learning that much about religious identity and diversity. They're just not in, in college unless they're, they're world religion majors or unless they're, they're major hobbies, interfaith activities. And so the, what your students know about the world's great religions and about how their own spirituality interacts with the different faiths, et cetera, et cetera, they're likely learning at home in their faith community and at an independent school. So I, I, you know, I, I don't mean this to intimidate anybody, but just to say, I think that there's a powerful responsibility that independent schools have to teach about religious identity and diversity. Next slide. So uh, the United States is the most religiously diverse nation in human history and the most religiously devout nation in the Western hemisphere. I'm gonna repeat that. It is a striking fact, okay? We are the most religiously diverse nation in human history. More people from more different religions have gathered in this political entity than in any other political entity in human history. And we are a nation in which religious identity matters to folks by way of devotion. Our rates of going to church or synagogue or mosque or people saying they believe in God or that they pray before meals or that religion is important in their lives is significantly higher than uh, other Western or industrialized nations. Uh, And so you're navigating a pretty complex religious landscape in this country. And here are some of those numbers. Uh, The Muslim population is set to double over the course of the next generation or so. The Hindu population is set to grow by 50%. The Jewish population is set to grow by about 25%. These are just some of the numbers related to religious diversity. So um, I'm going to give you another interesting fact here. So in your mind, or if you want, you can put in the chat, uh, um, what is the median age of white Christians in America? What's the median age of white Christians? Just for fun, why don't folks put it in the chat if, if, if the chat's available to you? Maybe it's not. Um, or just discuss it with your friends. <laughs> All right, a couple of guesses here, ranging from 40 to 50, 47, uh, 54. I like the specificity here. Okay, the median age of white Christians is uh, 57, roughly 57. Okay, 
And now, you know, there's give or take a year or two here, depending whether people are mainline, mainline or evangelical, but it's roughly, it's roughly 57, mid to late 50s. So what's the median age of uh, Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists? Rough guess? All right, people are generally in the right ballpark here. Median age of Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists is roughly mid 30s to mid 40s. Hindus and Muslims is mid 30s, Buddhists is about mid 40s. But you kind of get a picture of American society. And in fact, I'm gonna show you pictures of American society based on this, right? What, what's happening if you're in your mid 30s? You got probably got a pretty good chance you got kids in school, pretty good chance uh, if you're a professional, you're like hitting high gear in your career, right? What happens if you're late 50s? These are different life stages. They're different life stages. And you can project a society out 10, 20, 30 years from now, right? America is the most religiously diverse society in human history and the most religiously devout society in the Western hemisphere. You know, and knowing these numbers, I think, um, really matter. So next slide. So let me give you some kind of visual representation of this. So this is Norman Rockwell's famous freedom of worship from 1943, right? And by the way, like this is pretty far reaching for its time. You see what appears to be a Catholic woman with a rosary there. So, so Catholics were, there was deep discrimination against Catholics in this era of history. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt famously said, um, uh, America is a Protestant nation and Jews and Catholics are here under sufferance. Okay, that's his, that, you know, the great liberal lion, Franklin Roosevelt says that in the 1940s. And Norman Rockwell is saying, actually Catholics belong here. I'm gonna put one front and center. You can see uh, what appears to be uh, um, a Muslim, uh, perhaps from Africa, perhaps from South Asia, uh, um, there in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, um, but this is, this is, how Norman Rockwell imagines American religious diversity under the ideal of freedom of worship uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Our nation no longer fits this image. Next slide. That's what our nation really looks like. That's what our nation looks like. So a lot of people are walking around with, go back for a second, Jacob. Previous slide. They're walking around with this image in their heads. This, this, is, this is what American religious diversity looks like. And as I said, this isn't, this isn't bad. This is a forward leaning image for 1943. Okay, it is directionally right. But, and let's go back to the, to the current slide. This is what America looks like now and will certainly look like in the years and decades to come. And, and shifting our mental model of the country is really important. This is what our, our hospitals look like. Yeah, I always say to people, um, uh, if you wanna know what America is gonna look like, go to its preschools. Don't go to its Rotary clubs. As much as I love Rotary, go to America's preschools. That's the society you're gonna live in. That's the society you're gonna live in, right? So what does it look like to be an educated person, an effective citizen, uh, uh, an excellent professional, somebody with their own religion and spirituality in a highly religiously diverse and devout society? It is a really exciting thing, but it's also a complicated thing, which is precisely why we have education, which is precisely why I think it is incumbent upon your schools to really lean into religious identity and diversity issues. So let me give you some examples of, of what I mean by that, some, some kind of content examples. So, so next slide. So we just, uh, we just had, uh, we just celebrated Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s day, Junior Day yesterday. And, and I'm sure that your schools uh, last week or this week, they're, you're doing celebrations of, of that day. Uh, King's, um, King's role as a hero of nonviolence, as a civil rights hero, as a great American hero. Um, 
I also think that King was an interfaith hero. And I think that that dimension of King's life and that dimension of the civil rights movement is not talked about enough. And so this is the famous march at Selma. Right? And, and Reverend Jen Bailey talks about this in her video, but uh, there's King, as you can see. And one of my favorite lines by King is, is um, many people want to make of me many things, but in the deep recesses of my heart, I am a Baptist preacher. My daddy was a Baptist preacher. My granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. My great granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. And my commitment to Jesus as the son of the living God is the highest commitment I have, higher than race or nation or creed. So now I wanna ask you a question. How many of your schools will emphasize that dimension of Martin Luther King Jr.? The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., right? The one who says the single most important thing in my life is my faith. I, I, I could not be who I am without the anchor and compass of my Christian faith. Right? And by the way, that Christian faith leads him, that Baptist faith leads him to friendships and partnerships with people of all faiths. So over King's left shoulder there is the great rabbi, uh, rab, doc, rabbi Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, who escapes the trains going from Warsaw to Auschwitz by six weeks, barely escapes the Holocaust. Six million of his fellow countrymen, of, of, his, of, his, of his co-religionists, die in Hitler's hellfires, including his entire family and, and, and largely every uh, Hasidic master. I mean, he's one of, the, he's one of uh, a handful of Hasidic masters who make it out, right? And one of the things that he does when he comes to the United States and he takes up a position at the Jewish Theological Seminary in the Upper West Side of Chicago is he, he carves out for himself a role in the civil rights movement. He says that the soul of Judaism is at stake in the civil rights movement. That is a massive thing. It is massive that a Jew that escapes the Holocaust would come to the United States and become involved in the freedom and justice movement of a different community. When King was leaving Memphis, the city in which he was martyred, he was heading to Rabbi Heschel's home for Passover dinner. Right? That was the closeness of their friendship, right? This is, this is Selma as, a, as an interfaith movement. There is a Catholic nun that you can see, a Catholic sister that you can see uh, front and center in this, uh, in this picture. There's a huge Catholic involvement in the civil rights movement. There's a famous story of a Catholic sister who says, where is the church marching down Highway 80 in Selma? Where is the church? The church is here. The church is with me. There is John Lewis, a young John Lewis. John Lewis, who is so animated by his Christian faith that when he is a child of tenant farmers in Georgia, he preaches to the chickens in the backyard. And like King, when he is a seminary student, he is deeply moved by the writing and example of a Hindu leader from India, Gandhi. In fact, King and John Lewis have maintained that the most Christ-like person in the 20th century was not a Christian. It was a Hindu. It was Gandhi, right? So I show this photo and I tell these stories because all of this is an important part of what it means to be an educated person, to know these dimensions of King's life, to know his admiration for Gandhi, to know his friendship with Abraham Joshua Heschel, to know that when he felt despondent in the middle of the night, he would call Mahalia Jackson and ask her to sing a gospel song. It's part of what it means to be an educated person. And frankly, a part of a our spiritual and religious development, right? Uh, to know that actually your faith might be strengthened by learning about people from other faiths as Kings and John Lewis's was, that your faith might be strengthened by friendships with people from different faiths as the example of King and Heschel demonstrate. You know, Heschel famously says, um, the way that, that Reverend King and I pray is different, but in Selma, our legs were in worship. And that's a great lesson, right? What does it mean to recognize that prayer is different, 
but sometimes by acting together, there is something worshipful taking place. That is a great lesson to include in curriculum. You know, so this is, uh, this is what, 1965, 1966. Uh, let's go to the next slide and let's go back a ways. Because actually, this is really at the heart of the founding. And listen, we all know that, that the European founders of the 76th generation got, they got lots of things wrong when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, when it comes to class, they got lots of things wrong. But when it comes to religious identity and diversity, they honestly got virtually everything right. Uh, they set a North Star that is worth achieving. And one of the great moments in this takes place in <clears throat> 1790, 1791, when George Washington, president at the time, receives a letter from a man named Moses Sessius. Moses Sessius is the leader of the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, the Turo Synagogue, which incidentally still exists. And Moses Sessius asks George Washington, first of all, congratulates him on, on his presidency, congratulates him on the birth of this new nation, this you know, great possible hope in human history, and he says, you know, my people, we Jews, we have been hounded and hated and harassed for hundreds of years, especially in Europe. What will happen to us in the new nation? And George Washington writes back one of the great founding documents in American history. I mean, like literally up there with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. It's a document called the Letter to the Hebrew Congregation of Newport, Rhode Island. And George Washington says to Moses Sessius, my government will give to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance. May the children of the stock of Abraham sit under their own vine and fig and let there be none to make them afraid. So people in the audience who are especially biblically literate will recognize that that last line comes from Micah. It comes from the Bible. George Washington, an only occasional churchgoer, is literate enough in the Bible and considers it important enough in his own life and in the life of the Republic that he quotes it to a Jewish leader in the late 18th century. I mean, I gotta tell you something, like to give bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance, like that, that could go up in, in you know, that, that could go up in diversity posters all over the school, right? I mean, that sounds like a 2023 thing. And it was 1791, and it was about religion. And it was by the President of the United States at the time, who incidentally not only owned slaves, but had a mouthful of his slaves' teeth. So now that's a complexity worth exploring. We teach the tension. We teach the tension, right? We teach the tension. It is worth spending time on how the founder, the European founders understood religious identity and diversity. It is worth knowing that Thomas Jefferson reverentially owned a Quran. It is worth knowing that Benjamin Franklin builds a hall in Philadelphia and says, the pulpit of this hall will be open to preachers of any persuasion. If the Grand Mufti of Constantinople wants to send a Muslim preacher, this pulpit is at his service. Franklin makes donations to every religious community in Philadelphia that has a physical building. And he says to them, I want you to celebrate July 4th together. You know, uh, you can be Jews and Presbyterians and Quakers and Methodists and all and Anglicans. And on July 4th, you are collectively all of those things and you are Americans, right? It is worth knowing what the European founders had to say about religious diversity, because my view is it sets a North Star and our Republic has ever since attempted to achieve it. And by the way, King, like literally would hold up the Bible and the constitution and say, we come from these two documents. He would say this in the, revivals at the black churches at, at black churches when he would speak at night after a long day of marching he would hold up the bible and the constitution and say we would come from we come from these two documents okay 
So to understand that we have this, that, that we tried something new in human history to become a religiously diverse democracy and that the architecture that the European founders put into place, you know, the, the way political philosophers say this is the furniture they put in the room, right? Is furniture that we still live with and largely when it comes to religious diversity is furniture that we're happy with. That's a, that's a pretty stunning thing. A pretty stunning, and it's worth knowing about. It, that is part of being an educated person. It's part of being an educated person. It certainly helps with being an effective citizen and an excellent professional and having a sense of one's own religious and spiritual identity, knowing that you live in a nation that actually encourages that. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I love to keep a running list of, of, uh, of great Americans that, that nobody's ever heard of and, and the remarkable things that they did. Uh, I also think that this is part of the definition of being an educated person. And here's one of them, Julius Rosenwald. So if you know who Julius Rosenwald is, we cannot see you, but draw a little gold star on your notepad right now, because he is a hugely important American. And if you know who he is, good for you. So he was the number three person at Sears Roebuck, early 20th century. He's the guy that didn't get his name on the building, right? It wasn't Sears Roebuck Rosenwald, but he's the guy that created all the processes, right? All the processes. He's the one who made sure that when you ordered a product out of the mail catalog, it actually got to you, okay? And he became very wealthy and he was a deeply committed Jew. And he would meet with his rabbi at Temple Sinai in Chicago, not quite walking distance from where I am, but, uh, but, but, a, but a, a couple of stones throws away. And he would talk to his rabbi about how the Jewish ethic of tikkun olam, how he could live that out as a very wealthy person. And uh, his rabbi introduces him to a man named Booker T. Washington, plays a key role in the uplift of African-Americans. And Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington hit off. They meet at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, still exists. And Julius Rosenwald builds 5,000 black schools in the first part of the 20th century. He partners with black communities, okay? He says, I will put up 50% of the money and you will partner with me and raise 50% and we will build a school in your community. There was a time in American history in which something like a third of the black kids in school were in Rosenwald schools, okay? It just a remarkable human being. The Museum of Science and Industry was once known, and in Chicago was once known as the Rosenwald Museum. He hated that. He hated that, right? He did not like his name on things, okay? The School of Social Service Administration built at the University of Chicago, built by Julius Rosenwald. In fact, there was a time when the University of Chicago was going to close if it did not raise enough philanthropic money, and Julius Rosenwald was head of the pack in donating, right? Just one of the He's, he, he is uh, of, the, of the Carnegie uh, 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 Mellon generation of philanthropists, late 19th, early 20th century. He's the one that nobody's ever heard of. Why do I tell his story? Because he does what he does for the same reason that King did what he did. His faith. This is about Julius Rosenwald as a Jew. That's why he did what he did. Because he believed that you don't let oppression go unchecked because he believed that being a Jew meant helping people from any background, right? And he literally helps build the civic architecture of, uh, in partnership with black communities and black leaders, that's key. He helps build the civic architecture of black uplift in the early 20th century. Incidentally, he also starts the Julius Arts, the Rosenwald Arts Fellowship, go look it up. It is hard to name, uh, um, a black artist of the Harlem Renaissance that did not get a Rosenwald Arts Fellowship. Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, like Harlem Renaissance and immediately post Harlem Renaissance, Julius Rosenwald funds them all, right? Uh, the flowering of black creativity in life happens um, in a deep and beautiful way in partnership with the Jew. This is part of the interfaith history of America. 
This is something, honestly, we should all know. And you know what? There's a million stories like this. There's a million stories like this, right? So who had the first integrated swing band in America? Benny Goodman. Why do you think that's the case? Benny Goodman was a Jew. He didn't like how Jews were treated in America. He was especially sensitive to how Black people were treated as a result of that. So he is proactive about having Black musicians in his band. Louis Armstrong wears a star of David till the day he dies. Why? Because Louis Armstrong was, at, when he was a child, eight or nine years old, he was employed by a Russian Jewish immigrant family in New Orleans named the Karnofskys. He blew the tin horn on their junk wagon. He ate dinners at their house. He would listen to their Russian Jewish lullabies. They're singing. He would absorb it all, right? Like, like really, like American music comes from Louis Armstrong. He is the great American musical genius, the great American musical genius. And one day when he was passing a store, he looked in it longingly at this cornet in the window. And he's just staring at this cornet. And Mr. Karnofsky walks in the store and buys it from him for him. And Louis Armstrong puts that horn to his lips and music comes out. That is the beginning of Louis Armstrong. And Louis Armstrong knows exactly where he comes from, right? He wears that Star of David in honor of the Karnofskys. America is built on these stories, right? America is built on these stories. America is built on partnerships between people from different faiths, building things that benefit us all. My wife organized a, um, a service trip for the family on King Day yesterday. We went to a Black Baptist church. Uh, um, uh, I think it's Stone Point Church uh, on the west side of Chicago. So we walk into this beautiful Black Baptist church. You know what we see? Jewish stars everywhere. Stars of David everywhere. Why? Because they bought the, the Black Baptist community, bought that church from a Romanian Jewish community 70 years ago. It was once a synagogue. And the the head pastor, the senior pastor, and his wife said, there's holiness in this space already. We're not, we're not getting rid of the iconography of the Jewish people. There's holiness in this space. We're going to keep that. That's the, that's the church that King preached in most frequently when he was in Chicago. You know, look, I could go on and on, right? This is the history of America. This is the, the, the history of America is an interfaith history, and it's remarkably inspiring, and we should know it, and we should tell it. Next slide. So there's all kinds of, like, fascinating issues when it comes to, to religious identity and diversity. Uh, 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 issues that, you know, make for great educational case studies. Issues that, uh, um, uh, you know, because of our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, the stakes are high and, and you got to get them right. And these are the kinds of things that I think we should be teaching about in school. Uh, um, so let me tell you about this one. So Samantha al this young woman, she's a fashionista, self-described. She walks into an Abercrombie and Fitch uh, outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she lives in 2007. And she's looking for a job. And she's a devoted Muslim. She's wearing a hijab, a head covering, as you can see. And uh, she doesn't get the job. And it turns out that her application is downgraded because she doesn't fit the quote unquote look policy of Abercrombie. And Samantha Hoof goes to the EEOC and she sues. And the EEOC sues Abercrombie and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And Abercrombie claims we did not we, did, we didn't religiously discriminate against Samantha Hoof because we had no idea what she was wearing on her head was religious, was religious attire, right? If we had known it was religious in nature, of course, we know about the First Amendment. We know about the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Of course, we would have given her a job. There's, we would have a religious exception. Uh, the Supreme Court says to Abercrombie, an eight to nothing ruling written by uh, uh, Scalia uh, with uh, um, a concurring but not a dissenting opinion. That's where the other one comes from. That Abercrombie does not have a right to create it, to claim ignorance. That it is incumbent upon Abercrombie to know enough about the world's religions to know that when a woman comes into uh, 
a store wearing the kind of headscarf that Samantha Hoof is wearing. It's not a casual baseball cap. It is religious attire. It is incumbent upon Abercrombie to know that. That is a stunning decision. That is a stunning Supreme Court decision, right? It should have created shockwaves through companies across the country. It, it is incumbent upon you to know enough about the world's religions that some that that person wearing a kirpan if you're a Sikh, a dot if you're a Hindu, a headscarf if you're a Muslim, whatever else, that what what you are doing is religious in nature, and that the Constitution and congressionally passed legislation offers you an exemption. And every year there are major religious identity and diversity cases that come to the Supreme Court. And honestly, they win virtually every time. So this April, another case will come to the Supreme Court, which is a postal worker who, for religious reasons, uh, wanted Sundays off, and the post office accommodated for a certain period of time and then couldn't, for whatever scheduling reasons, accommodate anymore. The postal worker sues, and it is going to the Supreme Court. And I bet you the postal worker wins, because honestly, in the last 15 or 20 years, religious identity issues have won and by both liberal and conservative justices. Now you may agree or not with that, but the point is you better know about it, right? You better know about it because if you're a doctor or a diplomat, if you're a lawyer or a business person, it is part of your job to know something about the religious diversity of the world. Next slide. So, you know, a big part of what I do and what my organization Interfaith America does is, is diversity trainings around, around religious identity and diversity. And we never want to say just do a religious identity diversity training so you don't get sued. That we like that is not who we are, right? It's not just about mitigating the bad, it's about leaning into the good, about, about the, the, the wonderful and diverse beauty of our nation. And this example from Nike is an ex, is an exceptional demonstration of this. So Martha Moore, who's VP at Nike, she's at the beach one day and she notices that a group of women are not going into the water and they are dressed in a way that is very different from how other people are dressed. None of their skin is exposed. And, you know, she puts two and two together and she realizes this is actually a, a religious commitment issue that these women have a particular understanding of religiously based modesty uh, and that, that they are not going to expose skin in the ways that other people feel comfortable doing on a beach. And honestly, some quick calculations figure out, like, honestly, that's a pretty big market. Okay. There's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world and half of them are women. If even half of those women, if even half of those women have some semblance of, of, uh, an understanding of modesty, in which you don't expose skin in the way that Western style bathing suits have you expose skin. That's a market of 400 million people. That's a lot of people. Who makes bathing suits for those people? And by the way, it's not just Muslims. There's a lot of Orthodox Jews. There are Mormons. There are some versions of evangelical Christians. There may be Amish and Mennonites. There are some, uh, uh, some interpretations of Hinduism and Buddhism that might fall into this category. In other words, uh, 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 religious understandings of modesty that bathing suits are typically not designed for. Martha Moore says to herself, well, just so happens to be, I work for the largest sports apparel company in the world. We'll design for you. And that's where this line of clothing comes from, the, uh, the victory wear line of clothing. Right now, I love this. I love this because it is inclusive. It's including, there's a whole set of women who can play sports, who can go to the beach, who can go to the swimming pool in ways that they couldn't like five years ago. But it's also good for a company. Like, I, I don't want diversity issues to be like hounding people into doing things. I want this to be win win, right? I, I want as much as possible diversity issues should be win-win. Uh, uh, and, and I think, you know, thinking to yourself, I run a company or I run a school or I run a hospital and I want all my employees, I want all my customers to feel that they can thrive and that they feel well-served. 
And that means leaning positively into diversity issues, including religious identity and diversity issues. And I gotta tell you something like, like this, this is a this is a dimension of diversity that is almost totally unexplored with the exception of a handful of faith-based schools who are obviously committed to their own religious identity and realize that faith can be a bridge of cooperation and so cultivate an understanding and a relationship with people of other religious identities. So uh, final slide, which is, this is what we do at my organization, Interfaith America. I have a podcast on these issues with some great folks. David Brooks has been a part of it, Krista Tippett, John Powell. You can find it at Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, um, so um, my podcast, Interfaith America with Evie Patel, and my book that just got published last May uh, is a lot about religious, religious identity and diversity issues. And it's a positive and proactive and inspiring take. You know, uh, uh, um, As I said, I, I just think diversity issues we should think about them as a potluck supper where people from a range of identities are bringing their, their wonderful, delicious, diverse dishes. And we are creating a space for creative combinations and, and enriching conversations. Uh, um, diversity should be delightful uh, um, and it should not feel like a battleground. And that's how we do our work at Interfaith America. And that is that for me. And I'm looking forward to questions, comments, poems, songs, insights, whatever you got. Ibu, we have a question. Um, somebody said, I love hearing about lesser known religious leaders, but why don't we hear about women leaders in religion or women's contributions to religion? Yeah, well, I, you know, I opened the story with, uh, with Jen Bailey for, for that reason. You know, uh, um, and I actually do a version of this talk that highlights a whole set of, of female religious leaders, uh, Diane Nash and Ella Baker. Uh, um, and so I'm happy to come back and talk about those folks. They're some of my greatest heroes. Uh, in, in my book, we need to build, um, I would say the, the, kind of, the, the kind of signature hero of that book is, is, is Jane Addams, who, who was very much a faith-based interfaith hero. So I hear you. Uh, if I talk for another 30 minutes, there'd be lots of women uh, worked in there. Uh, uh, but, but I wanted to start off with the story of Jen Bailey, precisely because she's a po powerful, positive female leader. Um, another question, when do you think you should start teaching in schools about religious diversity? And how do we make sure we cover all religions in America in our schools? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of the um, uh, I think you, you, as soon as you start, so if you're a faith-based school and you're talking about kids' personal, spiritual, and ethical development, and, and honestly, a lot of Isaac schools do this, right? As soon as you start talking about people's personal, spiritual, and ethical developments, you can start talking about other people's personal, spiritual, and ethical development, right? Uh, um, uh, that, that, that's a good rule of thumb. That's a good rule of thumb because so much of what you learn in younger grades is like how to get along positively with people who are similar to you and different than you, right? So, so you have a personal spirituality and or religion. Other people do too. How wonderful is that, you know? Uh, and then part of, part of what I wanted to do here by weaving in the story of King and Selma and the story of George Washington is every school teaches about King. Every school teaches about George Washington. Do you teach about the religious and interfaith dimensions of King or about the, 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 the dimensions of George Washington where he's standing up for his Jewish neighbor? Again, in a really powerful document, the, the, the letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. So, so there are many ways you can engage interfaith content by weaving it into the things you already talk about. The civil rights movement is a perfect example and talking about uh, um, the American European found the European founding of America is, is, uh, um, is a perfect example too. So that might be a way to introduce that if you are in a non non religious school or not a faith based school. Right, right, and 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 that's a great uh, Jill. That's a great point. And, and it's listen, it's not controversial to talk about King Martin Luther King Jr. the Christian. It's not controversial because it's just I mean like. The people who don't do it, it's because they don't know enough. They, they don't know enough about that dimension of King. But the beautiful thing about knowing, not knowing enough is you can learn it, you know, but it should not be controversial to talk about King's commitment to his Christian faith 
and his positive and powerful relationships with people from other faiths. Um, and never too soon to start talking about it in the family. Would you agree? I, I think so. I think so. And again, like if you if you think about this, if you'll notice, like the examples that I'm giving, they're positive and they're inspiring and they're not particularly controversial. Right. And and I think that that's that's that doesn't mean that there aren't controversies involved. You know, I like to say diversity is not just the differences that you like, but there are so many straightforward, positive and powerful things to talk about the way that religious diversity and interfaith cooperation is woven into the fabric of the nation. That is a great place to start. That is a great place to start. Thank you, Ibu. Um, so much to think about, so much to talk about. And um, we hope that folks will feel comfortable sharing uh, the recording of this session with members of their, their immediate family and um, certainly access the opening video as well um, and take another look at that and share it at the school. Um, and as we say, we're hoping that this is a springboard for more conversation, that it doesn't stop here, that you find many ways to continue the conversation um, in your own circles. And we thank you for being here, all of our our many schools that are represented and um, our deep gratitude to Ibu for being with us once again. And we've had a decades long partnership with him and his organization for which we are deeply grateful. And again, the webinar will be available until midnight on May 31st. And um, we hope to see all of you at our next parent series webinar on February 15th, when we will be addressing Raising Our Village, Creating a Culture of Dignity with Rosalind Wiseman. And uh, the post-webinar email will include a pre-registration link for that. So the conversation will continue. Ibu, thank you again, everybody. Our gratitude to you and uh, the good work that everyone is doing in uh, facilitating these important conversations. And have a good night. We wish you well. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.